Winesburg, Ohio, by Sherwood Anderson. The Teacher, Concerning Kate Swift Snow lay deep in the streets of Winesburg. It had begun to snow about ten o'clock in the morning, and a wind sprang up and blew the snow in clouds along Main Street. The frozen mud roads that led into town were fairly smooth, and in places ice covered the mud. "'There will be good sleighing,' said Will Henderson, standing by the bar in Ed Griffith's saloon. Out of the saloon he went and met Sylvester West, the druggist, stumbling along in the kind of heavy overshoes called Arctics. "'Snow will bring the people into town on Saturday,' said the druggist. The two men stopped and discussed their affairs. Will Henderson, who had on a light overcoat and no overshoes, kicked the heel of his left foot with the toe of the right. "'Snow will be good for the wheat,' observed the druggist sagely. Young George Willard, who had nothing to do, was glad because he did not feel like working that day. The weekly paper had been printed and taken to the post office Wednesday evening, and the snow began to fall on Thursday. At eight o'clock, after the morning train had passed, he put a pair of skates in his pocket and went up to Waterworks Pond, but did not go skating. Past the pond and along a path that followed Wine Creek, he went until he came to a grove of beech trees. There he built a fire against the side of a log and sat down at the end of the log to think. When the snow began to fall and the wind to blow, he hurried about getting fuel for the fire. The young reporter was thinking of Kate Swift, who had once been his schoolteacher. On the evening before he had gone to her house to get a book, she wanted him to read, and had been alone with her for an hour. For the fourth or fifth time, the woman had talked to him with great earnestness, and he could not make out what she meant by her talk. He began to believe she must be in love with him, and the thought was both pleasing and annoying. Up from the log he sprang, and began to pile sticks on the fire. Looking about to be sure he was alone, he talked aloud, pretending he was in the presence of the woman. Oh, "'You're just letting on. You know you are,' he declared. "'I am going to find out about you. You wait and see.' The young man got up and went back along the path toward town, leaving the fire blazing in the wood. As he went through the streets, the skates clanked in his pocket. In his own room in the new Willard house, he built a fire in the stove and lay down on top of the bed. He began to have lustful thoughts, and, pulling down the shade of the window, closed his eyes and turned his face to the wall— He took a pillow into his arms and embraced it, thinking first of the schoolteacher, who by her words had stirred something within him, and later of Helen White, the slim daughter of the town banker, with whom he had been for a long time half in love. By nine o'clock of that evening, snow lay deep in the streets, and the weather had become bitter cold. It was difficult to walk about. The stores were dark, and the people had crawled away to their houses. The evening train from Cleveland was very late, but nobody was interested in its arrival. By ten o'clock, all but four of the eighteen hundred citizens of the town were in bed. Hop Higgins, the night watchman, was partially awake. He was lame and carried a heavy stick. On dark nights he carried a lantern. Between nine and ten o'clock he went his rounds. Up and down Main Street he stumbled through the drifts, trying the doors of the stores. Then he went into alleyways and tried the back doors. Finding all tight, he hurried around the corner to the new Willard house and beat on the door. "'Through the rest of the night he intended to stay by the stove. "'You go to bed. I'll keep the stove going,' he said to the boy "'who slept on a cot in the hotel office. "'Hop Higgins sat down by the stove and took off his shoes. "'When the boy had gone to sleep, he began to think of his own affairs. "'He intended to paint his house in the spring "'and sat by the stove calculating the cost of paint and labor. "'That led him into other calculations. "'The night watchman was sixty years old and wanted to retire.' He had been a soldier in the Civil War and drew a small pension. He hoped to find some new method of making a living, and aspired to become a professional breeder of ferrets. Already he had four of the strangely shaped savage little creatures that are used by sportsmen in the pursuit of rabbits in the cellar of his house. "'Now I have one male and three females,' he mused. "'If I am lucky, by spring I shall have twelve or fifteen. In another year I shall be able to begin advertising ferrets for sale in the sporting papers.' The night watchman settled into his chair, and his mind became a blank. He did not sleep. By years of practice, he had trained himself to sit for hours through the long nights, neither asleep nor awake. In the morning, he was almost as refreshed as though he had slept. With Hop Higgins safely stowed away in the chair behind the stove, only three people were awake in Winesburg. George Willard was in the office of the Eagle, pretending to be at work on the writing of a story. 
but in reality continuing the mood of the morning by the fire in the wood. In the bell tower of the Presbyterian Church, the Reverend Curtis Hartman was sitting in the darkness preparing himself for a revelation from God, and Kate Swift, the schoolteacher, was leaving her house for a walk in the storm. It was past ten o'clock when Kate Swift set out, and the walk was unpremeditated. It was as though the man and the boy, by thinking of her, had driven her forth into the wintry streets. Aunt Elizabeth Swift had gone to the county seat concerning some business in connection with mortgages in which she had money invested, and would not be back until the next day. By a huge stove called a base burner in the living room of the house sat the daughter reading a book. Suddenly she sprang to her feet, and, snatching a cloak from a rack by the front door, ran out of the house. At the age of thirty, Kate Swift was not known in Winesburg as a pretty woman. Her complexion was not good, and her face was covered with blotches that indicated ill health. Alone in the night in the winter streets, she was lovely. Her back was straight, her shoulders square, and her features were as the features of a tiny goddess on a pedestal in a garden in the dim light of a summer evening. During the afternoon, the school teacher had been to see Dr. Welling concerning her health. The doctor had scolded her and had declared she was in danger of losing her hearing. It was foolish for Kate Swift to be abroad in the storm, foolish and perhaps dangerous. The woman in the streets did not remember the words of the doctor and would not have turned back had she remembered. She was very cold, but after walking for five minutes no longer minded the cold. First, she went to the end of her own street, and then across a pair of hay scales set in the ground before a feed barn and into Trunion Pike. Along Trunion Pike, she went to Ned Winter's barn, and turning east followed a street of low-frame houses that led over Gospel Hill and into Sucker Road that ran down a shallow valley past Ike Smead's chicken farm to Waterworks Pond. As she went along, the bold excited mood that had driven her out of doors passed and then returned again. There was something biting and forbidding in the character of Kate Swift— Everyone felt it. In the schoolroom she was silent, cold, and stern, and yet, in an odd way, very close to her pupils. Once in a long while something seemed to have come over her, and she was happy. All of the children in the schoolroom felt the effect of her happiness. For a time they did not work, but sat back in their chairs and looked at her. With hands clasped behind her back, the schoolteacher walked up and down in the schoolroom and talked very rapidly. It did not seem to matter what subject came into her mind— Once she talked to the children of Charles Lamb, and made up strange, intimate little stories concerning the life of the dead writer. The stories were told with the air of one who had lived in a house with Charles Lamb, and knew all the secrets of his private life. The children were somewhat confused, thinking Charles Lamb must be someone who had once lived in Winesburg. On another occasion, the teacher talked to the children of Benvenuto Cellini. That time they laughed. What a bragging, blustering, brave, lovable fellow she made of the old artist. Concerning him also she invented anecdotes. There was one of a German music teacher who had a room above Cellini's lodgings in the city of Milan that made the boys guffaw. Sugar McNutts, a fat boy with red cheeks, laughed so hard that he became dizzy and fell off his seat, and Kate Swift laughed with him. And suddenly she became cold again and stern. On the winter night, when she walked through the deserted, snow-covered streets, a crisis had come into the life of the schoolteacher. Although no one in Winesburg would have suspected it, her life had been very adventurous. It was still adventurous. Day by day, as she worked in the schoolroom or walked in the streets, grief, hope, and desire fought within her. Behind the cold exterior, the most extraordinary events transpired in her mind. The people of the town thought of her as a confirmed old maid, and because she spoke sharply and went her own way, thought her lacking in all the human feeling that did so much to make her and mar their own lives. In reality, she was the most eagerly passionate soul among them, and more than once in the five years since, she had come back from her travels to settle in Winesburg and become a schoolteacher, and had been compelled to go out of the house and walk half through the night, fighting out some battle raging within." Once on a night when it rained, she had stayed out six hours, and when she came home had a quarrel with Aunt Elizabeth Swift. "'I am glad you're not a man,' said the mother sharply. "'More than once I've waited for your father to come home, not knowing what new mess he had gotten into. I've had my share of uncertainty, and you cannot blame me if I do not want to see the worst side of him reproduced in you.' Kate Swift's mind was ablaze with thoughts of George Willard. 
in something he had written as a schoolboy, she thought she had recognized the spark of genius and wanted to blow on the spark. One day in the summer, she had gone to the Eagle office, and finding the boy unoccupied, had taken him out Main Street to the fairground, where the two sat on a grassy bank and talked. The schoolteacher tried to bring home to the mind of the boy some conception of the difficulties he would have to face as a writer. "'You will have to know life,' she declared, and her voice trembled with earnestness. She took hold of George Willard's shoulders and turned him about so that she could look into his eyes. A passer-by might have thought them about to embrace. "'If you are to become a writer, you'll have to stop fooling with words,' she explained. "'It would be better to give up the notion of writing until you are better prepared. "'Now it's time to be living. "'I don't want to frighten you, but I would like to make you understand the import of what you think of attempting. "'You must not become a mere peddler of words.' The thing to learn is to know what people are thinking about, not what they say. On the evening before that stormy night, when the Reverend Curtis Hartman sat in the bell tower of the church waiting to look at her body, young Willard had gone to visit the teacher and to borrow a book. It was then the thing happened that confused and puzzled the boy. He had the book under his arm and was preparing to depart. Again, Kate Swift talked with great earnestness. Night was coming on, and the light in the room grew dim. As he turned to go, she spoke his name softly, and with an impulsive movement took hold of his hand. Because the reporter was rapidly becoming a man, something of his man's appeal, combined with the winsomeness of the boy, stirred the heart of the lonely woman. A passionate desire to have him understand the import of life, to learn to interpret it truly and honestly swept over her. Leaning forward, her lips brushed his cheek. At the same moment, he, for the first time, became aware of the marked beauty of her features. They were both embarrassed, and to relieve her feelings, she became harsh and domineering. "'What's the use? It will be ten years before you begin to understand what I mean when I talk to you,' she cried passionately. On the night of the storm, and while the minister sat in the church waiting for her, Kate Swift went to the office of the Winesburg Eagle, intending to have another talk with the boy. After the long walk in the snow— she was cold, lonely, and tired. As she came through Main Street, she saw the light from the print shop window shining on the snow, and on an impulse opened the door and went in. For an hour she sat by the stove in the office, talking of life. She talked with passionate earnestness. The impulse that had driven her out into the snow poured itself out into talk. She became inspired, as she sometimes did in the presence of the children in school— a great eagerness to open the door of life to the boy who had been her pupil and who she thought might possess a talent for the understanding of life had possession of her. So strong was her passion that it again became something physical. Again her hands took hold of his shoulders and she turned him about. In the dim light her eyes blazed. She arose and laughed, not sharply as was customary with her, but in a queer, hesitating way. "'I must be going,' she said. "'In a moment, if I stay, I'll be wanting to kiss you.' In the newspaper office, a confusion arose. Kate Swift turned and walked to the door. She was a teacher, but she was also a woman. As she looked at George Willard, the passionate desire to be loved by a man that had a thousand times before swept like a storm over her body took possession of her. In the lamplight, George Willard looked no longer a boy, but a man ready to play the part of a man.' The schoolteacher let George Willard take her into his arms. In the warm little office, the air became suddenly heavy, and the strength went out of her body. Leaning against a low counter by the door, she waited. When he came and put a hand on her shoulder, she turned and let her body fall heavily against him. For George Willard, the confusion was immediately increased. For a moment, he held the body of the woman tightly against his body, and then it stiffened. Two sharp little fists began to beat on his face. When the schoolteacher had run away and left him alone, he walked up and down the office, swearing furiously. It was into this confusion that the Reverend Curtis Hartman protruded himself. When he came in, George Willard thought the town had gone mad. Shaking a bleeding fist in the air, the minister proclaimed the woman George had only a moment before held in his arms an instrument of God bearing a message of truth. George blew out the lamp by the window, and locking the door of the print shop, went home. Through the hotel office, past Hop Higgins, lost in his dream of the raising of ferrets, he went up and up into his own room. The fire in the stove had gone out, and he undressed in the cold. When he got into bed, the sheets were like blankets of dry snow. 
George Willard rolled about in the bed on which he had lain in the afternoon, hugging the pillow, and thinking thoughts of Kate Swift. The words of the minister, who, he thought, had gone suddenly insane, rang in his ears. His eyes stared about the room. The resentment, natural to the baffled male, passed, and he tried to understand what had happened. He could not make it out. Over and over he turned the matter in his mind. Hours passed, and he began to think it must be time for another day to come. At four o'clock he pulled the covers up about his neck and tried to sleep. When he became drowsy and closed his eyes, he raised a hand, and with it groped about in the darkness. "'I have missed something. I have missed something Kate Swift was trying to tell me,' he muttered sleepily. Then he slept, and in all Winesburg he was the last soul on that winter night to go to sleep." The End of Winesburg, Ohio, The Teacher, Concerning Kate Swift Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the web at fcit.usf.edu